just want to go use the bathroom before we start. No, I'm asking. What's the universal like? Okay. Well, I couldn't tell if it was just kind of. I like your haircut, by the way. Oh, thanks. <laughs> My students today. Skips, did you get a haircut? I go, no. Hi. <laughs> there I go, okay. Wait, what, what um, grade do you teach again? 11th. 11th grade English. AP and English. Mm -hmm. Is that Hamlet? I, uh, <laughs> I haven't taught him in a couple of years. I teach Othello with my original kids, and I, I teach King Othello. Lear. I never read King Lear, but I hear that's the best one. I read Hamlet like, in this couple of years. I have a Next week. And you're going to announce Monday's meeting. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, the meeting yeah, no, I know. But I don't need that. I don't need that. Okay, I need it, I guess. Hey, we're all here. I'm calling the Governance Strategy and City Operations Committee meeting to order for May 2nd, 2019. Roll call, please. Councilor Armstrong? Here. Councilor McFarland? Uh, yes. Mary? Present. Councilor Kelly? Here. Councilor Gibbs? Here. Councilor Moore? Here. Well, today um, I'd like to begin with uh, a report from Matt Miller from CD. Uh, he's going to update us on the latest regarding the DRI and the parking plan. And thank you very much, uh, Matthew. I sent you some questions early in the week, and you we re responded to them, and I appreciate that. Sure. And actually, I don't have a copy of what I sent you guys, so if somebody can give me theirs. Oh, sure. Can you take Peter's? Yours? He's not here. Yeah. Okay. okay. Wait, wait. He had to go run and get something. Yeah. I was going to say, I swear I saw it. Right, so, Beth, I guess we're doing that now. Which one? The, uh, the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint. Let's go with that one. All right, so uh, first I'll give you uh, an update on uh, a few of the parking items. No, I'm sorry. I'll start with the Jerky Street project. So we have... Uh, Beth, it'll actually be a PDF. Sorry. Really? Yeah, I'm on the ball with it. That's all right. We were just waiting for P uh, Councilor Insel to arrive. And now we're all up to speed. So okay. after several weeks of discussion with uh, city council, city planners, the various boards that the Dirty Street development has to go through during its approval and permitting stage, this is the draft schedule that we have that lays out all the different steps and all of the different meetings that will take place before we get to groundbreaking down on the parking lot. Uh, so some of them, uh, notably the development agreements, are already completed. Uh, there are some design <laughs> modifications that Prime is working on based on some subsurface investigation they did down on the Turkey lot and how that will affect their initial concept. As you scroll down, we get to, um, and these are broken out by subjects, so there's a few legal ministerial things the city needs to do about uh, merging parcels and separating parcels. Uh, the permitting process itself, uh, we started that last week when a draft site plan was submitted to the planning board. 
first step there is for planning board to declare its intention to be lead agency for the review. Once that's done, letters go out to all the interested agencies. They have 30 days to respond. Um, planning board will likely be the lead agency for the duration of the secret review. There's a special use permit that the developer has to seek from the Zoning Board of Appeals, which would allow the Durkee lot to be used as a planned unit development. There's a subsequent approval of the actual planned unit development that has to be issued by the City Planning Board that allows um, some of the more stringent zoning codes to be worked into a more complex project, which gives the developer more versatility. Can you give an example of that? What, you know, just what they might be dealing with? Sure, so if you have two buildings on one parcel, the city zoning code requires one of them to be a primary structure and another to be a secondary structure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not much leeway built into it where if you want to have two primary structures, which is the way prime has it set up, right. secondary structure would be like the parking garage down at the ICB site. Right. So that allows them to get around that. Okay. Uh, we get to a number of city planning board meetings. And yeah, would you mind stating, stating the date because our viewing audience will not be able to oh, see sure. it. And these are based on the schedules for the different boards that have already been disseminated publicly for the rest of the year. And just so you have an understanding, there's a specific series of steps that have to be taken in order. Uh, so the board schedules line up in a certain way and one board can't take a certain action until another board has approved another action. So this is an ideal scenario, assuming there are no requests for additional information, which would push the schedule back. But we have uh, 426, that's when we sent in the initial application to the planning board for the seeker. Mm -hmm. The next planning board meeting is April 20, uh, April, I'm sorry, May 29th. Uh, that's when the planning board will declare its intention to be lead agency for seeker, and then all the letters go out. Uh, we then go to the Clinton County Planning Board. Uh, this is required because the development was in a certain linear distance of county-owned property, which would be the DSS building. Mm -hmm. uh, the City Zoning Board, we then go to them for the first meeting about the special use permit. We go back to the City Planning Board for their review of the planning unit development application. Uh, this will likely be subsequent to the planning board's approval of the special use permit, which will permit the planning board to sign off on the creation of the PUD. Um, and this will include, uh, okay, so we also have uh, site plan applications for the Durkee Street development, uh, the Arts Park, the Riverfront Access Boardwalk, and Streetscape improvements. So those are the other conjoining projects because each of them are a separate action. Each of them has a separate seeker review process, but none of them will be as complex as the primary seeker review for <laughs> the Durkee Street development proper. So after that, there's some time to revise plans based on notes from the Zoning and Planning Board meetings, and then that next page, please. Uh, second meeting with the County Planning Board. Uh, in the beginning of July, we should get a decision from the County Planning Board as to whether they're signing off on the site plan or if they're determining that this is simply a local issue and they don't need to weigh in. <coughs> the City Zoning Board then meets again in the second week, sorry, the third week of July, that's July 15th, and that will be the second meeting to discuss the special use permit application. Uh, City Planning Board meets again on July 22nd. And then we kind of bump back and forth between the city zoning and planning boards, uh, again, talking about site plan changes, further discussion on special use permits, and moving the seeker process forward. So finally, we get to September 16th, and it should be the final hearing for the city zoning board and the special use permit. Once that gets final approval, uh, the city can have, or the city planning board can have its public meeting on the seeker application, uh, prepare the final environmental impact statement, and a final determination on the uh, Dirty Street development seeker. And then in October, on the 15th, city zoning board meets again, which we should get final approval of the special use permit. The planning board meeting on October 22nd, uh, again, that's a review of the final site plan. 
and potentially close the hearing if there are no further public comments. The Clinton County IDA, the Industrial Development Agency, uh, they cannot officially act or consider a pilot application until a seeker determination has been made for the project. So while the application has been submitted, it's kind of on the back burner until the seeker process is done. So once Seeker is completed, the IDA can schedule a public hearing on the pilot application submitted by Prime for the project. Right before, I think that's right before Thanksgiving, the planning board meeting should give us final approval of the site plan, streetscape improvements, the yard park, the riverfront walk, so that all of these things get approved by the planning board at the same time, so that when we get to the bidding and construction phase, all of it can go out, hopefully, as one project to simplify the construction so there's not several things going on at various stages, and we have to coordinate with three or four different contractors. It's just an effort to simplify things as much as possible. And then we get to the, uh, about a week and a half before Christmas, there's a public hearing for the pilot application with the IDA. Right after the new year, a public comment period for the pilot ends. And middle of February, we should get a decision from the IDA on the pilot application. Uh, right after that, the appeal periods for all the state, federal, and other permits should be passed. And we should be free to close on the Dirty Street sale. And that's the actual transfer of the property to Prime, which does not take place until all of this else has been done. That's end of March, and uh, giving about a month for bidding and coordination of contractors. That gets us to groundbreaking for the project in the third week of April in 2020. Okay, so Matt, that's- so very simple. Yeah, <laughs> very simple and succinct. Thank you. Uh, but is that to appear on the website? Uh, we can throw it up there. Sure. I think that yeah. should yep. be. Definitely. Right. Okay. All right. And I believe that, um, you know, I hope that there's a means by which you know, kind of a con more condensed outline might be released to the press. I don't know, uh, you know, hopefully this will be covered, but we only have one person here. So is there a way to condense this into some kind of press release to share with the public? Uh, we can. I wouldn't recommend including all that No, 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 no. I'm not suggesting points, that. Just to, yeah. to provide benchmarks yeah, to the public. Yeah, just some benchmarks. So, yeah. I mean, it's a question of managing expectations as well because the public has waited a long time for this. The permitting process is cumbersome, but we want to make sure all of the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed before we move forward. Absolutely. Uh, but we want to also make sure that they understand that this isn't something that's going to be happening in a few months, which also alleviates some of the anxiety regarding the parking situation. Exactly. Well. So, and also I would suggest that along the way, if you see that there are adjustments to be made to this timeline, mm -hmm. that you update it on the site and then let us all know, and that would be helpful. Oh, yeah. As the board uh, meetings progress, if there's any change, any adjustment need to be made, we can certainly do that too. All right. Yeah, it's also okay. important to, to reflect on the, the planning board, the ZBA, the county planning board are all independent agencies. Absolutely. So this is a prospective yeah. plan. This is by no means. Yeah. I, that, I was going to ask, is this a conservative or rather aggressive schedule, I guess, as far as with the meeting and the planning work? This and, is fairly aggressive. This assumes there are no requests by any of the additional boards for more time to consider it or for changes to the plans that were submitted. So this is an ideal scenario. Um, as the process moves forward, if any of that occurs, we'll certainly adjust the schedule and push back the... Um, Groundbreaking date right. estimated. A year is ideal. What was ESD's reaction to this? I'm curious. Uh, we sent that to them and they said that. Empire's. What? Empire State, State Development. Development. Yes. Yeah, I mean, they were more concerned with the fact that we've got the developer on board for the project. Um, you know, they've been pushing us forward to move this uh, forward <laughs> as quickly as possible, but now that somebody Prime has made the commitment to put this kind of money into the city. They want to make sure that the process is followed to the T so that no objections can be made at a later date. The Prime feels comfortable, the public feels comfortable, the city council feels comfortable that everything is on the up and up. And they're very experienced in handling all this, so. Yep, this is what they do. So I, I did have a question though, because you, you were going through how um, there are gonna be so many working components actually get work done mm -hmm. I'm afraid I didn't catch the part where you said you, you I think you said something about not wanting to deal with multiple construction companies so could, what is going to be the plan for getting the construction done I'm not talking about the actual <coughs> multi-use building but 
the construction that's going to have to take place on Lake Hill. Infrastructure. Yeah, the, all the infrastructure stuff, is that going to be, how is yeah, that going to be handled? The intention is to have the approvals for all of those projects complete at more or less the same time, so the bidding process for all of them, to the greatest extent possible, can be lumped into one public bidding process. Okay. So that way that's you're dealing with question. a single contractor rather than three or four operating on different schedules. On, Mm -hmm. It just complicates things, right. especially with the reimbursement requirements for the grant money. And has Matt, Matt has Prime seen this? And this oh yeah, Prime has this. Okay. Yep. All right, and you mentioned something uh, that that I was very um, satisfied to hear that there's a a meeting organized for uh, Monday at 11 o'clock yep. and would you like to tell us a little bit about that yeah we set a meeting on monday at 11 o'clock here at city hall with all the principals involved in the project uh, prime myself the mayor corporation council um rochelle uh, sorry council armstrong is invited as well uh scott matthews who is the city's new community engagement coordinator to discuss a short medium and long-term public outreach strategy for the Durkee project to make sure that the the public is, you know, involved in the project, that they understand what's going on, that their concerns are being heard and addressed, and that um, some of the recent uh, confusion in the public sphere might be alleviated so we're all on the same page and can bring this project forward and make it as successful as possible for everybody. Excellent idea. Thank you for that. Yeah. Now, before we go into the parking uh, outline, which you've had put here, uh, mm -hmm. I, I've asked Patrick to kind of summarize uh, the way in which he's seen the process. I think that's worth review because I think there's a lot of public confusion regarding all of that as well. So, Patrick, would you mind? On parking. On parking. And then, of course, you will be able to uh, detail more completely what, what steps we're taking. Sure. Sure. Um, well, I'll uh, breeze through the early steps. So obviously, there was a parking study ordered. Uh, we did have a forum uh, um, almost a year ago. Um, uh, we approved the parking study, and then we um, started the parking committee. Uh, obviously, I'm the uh, city councilor on the parking committee. The parking committee has uh, been in its what I see as its first phase. It's never been strictly organized as such, but it's been... Um, more brainstorming, research, gathering data. We've uh, gathered some uh, pretty good data, uh, and um, I've certainly been researching. I've been sending all my research to the members of the committee. I've Raise also your hand if you received his information. I've sent some of it to the council as well. You've read a 700-page book. <laughs> That's no, it. you're in the process. Um, well, I finished it, but uh, <laughs> the. And so that was the first part. And that also included brainstorming um, as far as what kind of options there are available to replace parking. Um, one of the problems I've seen in the public sphere is that uh, every sort of idea that was a brainstorming idea seems to be taken into consideration as our plan. There's brainstorming ideas that are up there that you can see on the website that I'm vehemently against. Um, most of those will, you know, take on changing streets, making them one way, uh, putting an angled parking. Uh, that's something I'm personally against. Other people have may, may have other ideas on those, but uh, the brainstorming was just, and we heard this um, in public outcry too, about something about 500 spaces. Those were all brainstorming ideas as sort of um, options, possible options, that where extra parking could be found. Um, not all of them are equal, not all of them are as, um, as conceivable, especially on a price scale. Uh, but that is phase one, getting our research together, getting our data together, and getting um, the options available for replacing parking. Um, I believe we're gonna be entering what I see as phase two, uh, which is more of making decisions and deciding how to implement it. Um, we've also uh, we've been getting together an RFP to send out for um, on-street curbside um, efficiency, really, of uh, managing our on-street curb parking. Um, and then what's left to do now is uh, get down to the nitty-gritty details. After reviewing our research, um, after discussing um, what the possibilities are, is to really start making decisions and start making recommendations to the councils of how best to proceed. I have a lot of ideas in that 
Um, they are my personal ideas. Um, they haven't been uh, vetted by the committee yet, um, but I'm sure other committee members have their own personal ideas. Uh, and then finally, it would be come down to um, formulating a plan to implement those and, decisions. And using engineering consult to make sure the plan will work. Sure, if engineers are needed, that will certainly have to be a part of any implementation. Um, but right now, I, I think there's, there's been enough research, there's been enough uh, data, there's been enough... Um, we've also been taking public outreach on what... Um, and there's been enough research or searching into um, alternative parking sources, although we're still waiting on a couple of those options uh, to see how... Um, applicable or how okay. reachable they viable. Be. Yeah, viable. Okay. Is now I'm going to thank you. That's a good summary and I'd like uh, Matt to make any other comments that uh, Director Miller whatever I other comments you think would be now. helpful to the public so that they can see how this process is proceeding. Uh, I think Pat covered a, a lot of key points. Uh, I would encourage the public if they are looking for details or if they'd like to comment specifically about the parking issue. We have a parking advisory committee um, second Tuesday of every month here in the council chambers at 6 o'clock. They can come and listen to the discussion. Um, I don't know how much detail you'd like me to get into uh, what I sent you, Rochelle. Um, do you want to, I mean, since you reported out on the the spaces you'd have? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, Beth, can you pull up the PowerPoint? Thank you. Patrick, did you ever make contact with Andrew Desjardins? I absolutely did. I sent did. all my research. And, you know, I think it's she really important to view <laughs> all of these suggestions in the context of what uh, Councilor McFarland just said. Mm -hmm. That where this is just the first phase of considering what our options are. Yep. So uh, we've got a deficit of 289 spaces that we expect to lose when development of the Jerky Street lot uh, starts in earnest. And just, uh, Beth, you go up one slide, please. So just as a, yeah, as a reminder, these are just conceptual plans, and we are moving forward with a few of them, but they do not represent final engineered solutions for a lot of these options. So yeah, uh, so this is the Glen Falls lot. Um, we have gotten a hazmat study back from KAS. They are currently putting together bid specifications for the abatement and demolition of the building. Um, and we actually just this morning received a quote from AEDA for the engineering and design work to follow that for the actual parking lot to be constructed in its place. Right, and I'd just like to make a little bit of an editorial comment here because I did hear a lot of people scoffing about the fact that this, this was going to cost us, what is it, $3,000? Is a gentleman uh, from the DPW, is that a pretty typical kind of undertaking for any demolition, to find, especially of an older bu a building, to find asbestos that needs to be abated? Because he's talking about the survey itself, not the actual demo. Yeah, and, and not a disproportionately expensive uh, endeavor. For $3,000 to go through a sample building of that size, that's a very reasonable. Okay, so I just wanted to dispel that myth. Go yeah. ahead. Okay, so, um, and we'll be reviewing the quote from AEDA for the design work. Uh, next slide, please. Go. So that, conservatively, is about 115 spaces towards the 289 we need to find. <coughs> So the next one, and this is the Clinton County parking reconfiguration. Now the county had plans to make some changes to their parking lots uh, by the government center uh, before they came to the city with this plan. Uh, so Beth, next slide please. So this is the larger plan uh, that they proposed. There's a significant number of spaces that are added to their lot. Their initial plan <coughs> added fewer spaces than this. Um, this adds quite a few more, and I can go into more detail with you guys later. But uh, their one, uh, they made a few requests from the city in order to uh, follow through with this, none of which I felt were unreasonable. Uh, one of which would be to cover the difference in capital cost between their initial plan to reconfigure their parking lot and the configuration that you're looking at now. Now, I'm not talking about everything on Court Street. That would be a separate cost to the city on its own because that's our property, that's our project. 
Uh, but this is what, if uh, council approves of that project, what the county lot would look like after construction is complete. The pink space that you see, that is the proposal for a reconfiguration of Court Street. Uh, we get about 34 spaces there, and the county slot between their changes to the government center lot and their lot, lot on Oak Street, that gets us, what, 70? About 70. Matt, do the pink, do they represent uh, diagonal or? No, there's no diagonal parallel? Or, no, that's yeah, parallel? Those yeah. are perpendicular. Are, yeah, we're talking about And it's important degree. to note that this, this proposal, I think, was uh, written up by the county engineer. Or, mm -hmm. um, if we went forward with this, right now Matt's mostly been talking about what's north of Court Street. Uh, what's um, Court Street and south of Court Street there is, that would be purely a city project. And to go with that route, it would be, it would require closing of Court Street. I mean, Court Street would essentially become a parking lot. It would be a throughway within a parking lot. Yeah. One way. It wouldn't be one way. It's still two ways, but it wouldn't. Yeah. It wouldn't really be ideal for through traffic. And one of the other benefits to working with the county is all of the green direction. spaces that you see in their lot, that would be publicly available parking, whereby now it is meant exclusively for people at the county building for county business. Actually, when you say it wouldn't be conducive through traffic, there's no narrowing of the width of through traffic under this design. It's still 24 feet of standardized Two lane traffic. That's true, but you probably will have like cars pulling out of these uh, perpendicular mm -hmm. spots. You do, but you have parallel parking cars all along there right now as well. Correct? Do you have Blocks sure, curbage, I think curbage that, being cut in, or is that, or is what, curbage uh, think, being cut in, or I is that? I think from the initial sketch was sidewalks yeah. being narrowed. Yeah, but you know what? I think that if if this is actually something that we're going to consider as after the process is done. That a that a an engineer will be able to let us know in you know in detail how workable this plan is just in terms of the mechanics of it. Mm -hmm. I think an engineering firm has been commissioned. Yeah, we had okay. a meeting earlier this week with AEDA and representatives from the county to discuss their original plans, the expanded plans, and they are currently putting together cost estimates uh, both for the portion on the county parking lot and for the city's project on Court Street itself. Once we have those figures, we can determine based on the number of space that we would gain on Court Street if it's in the city's best financial interest to move forward with that on a cost per space basis compared to some of the other options that we're looking at. Yeah, what, what, I recall that you um, wrote a grant with the county to the Northern Borders Commission for this work. Actually, that's for the Glens Falls project. But I understood this could be also used for this. Yeah, that could Falls be added buttons. into it, absolutely. Yeah, and that would be a $500,000 grant that the county is working with the city on applying for. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, go ahead, Beth. <laughs> and this is the county's plan for reconfiguration of their Oak Street lot, which gets them an extra 18 spaces there as well. So, if we went through with all of that, go ahead, Beth. that's uh, 70 spaces added just to the county parking lot, so that brings us to 185 if you include the 115th in Glens Falls. And that includes like 34 if we went through with uh, No, that's street. just the county lots yeah. reconfigured. That's just the county lots. Okay. Okay. Yep. Uh, next slide, please. So the Court Street reconfiguration itself, uh, and again, this would be on the city's dime. Uh, that would be 34 additional spaces, and those are the pink ones that you saw on the map. Oh, you see, and there we have traffic calming measures. Because I imagine that you wouldn't want as much traffic or at least going through at the speed. If you would certainly want to reduce the speed limits, uh, possibly put in some, uh, some speed bumps just to make sure that people recognize this is a lane within a parking lot rather than a, a street. So. Uh, next slide. So that 34 brings to 219. Okay. Uh, the Derby Street developments. Uh, per the development agreement, Prime is required to provide at least 30 spaces on the site itself for public parking. Uh, so that gets added into the total, bringing us to 249. Those 30 spots, were, were they outlined by Prime when they did that presentation back last fall? 
Uh, I believe that was done subsequent to the initial presentation. The initial presentation um, was highlighting the diagonal parking along Durkee and Bridge Streets. Okay. So the spaces that can be added to Durkee Street on the street, uh, that's 29 spaces. And that would be essentially diagonal parking of one form or another going down Durkee Street. And that's going to be part of the larger process of getting development done. Got that? And there's a conceptual drawing of what it would look like. But that doesn't it's include Bridge Street. Bridge Street, right? Yeah, not, not yeah based on some feedback from DOT, um, we're looking at other options right now because they didn't mm -hmm. express some concerns about uh, diagonal parking on both sides of Bridge Street. Since so. it's Route 9. We yeah, have since it's a state yeah, yeah. traffic calming, instituting some other measures to make it feasible. It is possible, but just to remind those people who might have come earlier, these are all just possibilities, just options that are considered. There's nothing concrete being developed right now. And this is an initial concept for the southern end of Derby Street and along the bottom of the slides. Excuse me. That's Broad Street. Um, and you can add a few spaces uh, there as well without uh, too much of a detrimental effect on the traffic pattern. Although the left two are making it only a one-way street. Right. Uh, that's correct. And you've gotten feedback from all three counselors of concerning, you know, trying to make the priority off-street mm -hmm. rather than on-street, particularly where it, it looks like it could be really problematic for traffic. Yep, and the conversations we've had with the council, they have expressed a desire to, if at all possible, create the solution without rearranging any of the on-street parking, which is what we're trying to do. Uh, at this point, I can't guarantee you that we're going to be able to do that, but that yeah. is the goal that we're pursuing. Right. Uh, so that's 278 spaces. Uh, next. And the uh, Brinker Hall Street reconfiguration, that's an additional 11 spaces, and this will require turning Brinker Hall into a one-way street and putting diagonal parking on both sides. Uh, now we know that this is not a very popular option, and based on feedback from the council, uh, we have been pursuing shared use agreements with private lot owners downtown. And the intention is to, if we can find cooperation with those private lot owners, that would that additional off street capacity would allow us to forego some of the less popular options like Brinker Hall Street and possibly the diagonal parking along Derby. So that's what we're aiming for. But if you do include that Brinker Hall for configuration and has 11 spaces, next slide please. And there's a rough estimate of what it could look like. What, what is that one? I'm sorry, that I looked down. Brinker Hoff between Oak, oh, okay. Oak, Oak gotcha. on the left and Margaret on the right. Yeah. Why would it switch? If we yeah, why would, the, they, why would switch? they switch uh, the parallel on the... Uh, and keep was, parallel in front of the <laughs> strand? <laughs> it works out when you actually have to try to graph it out and like measure it all out. Well, what? and once again, this would yeah. never be possible unless an engineer said it was possible. So all yeah. this is is just a con concept yeah. <laughs> that we're trying to fit within the framework of evaluating all of our needs and choosing the best. Uh, option. That's right. So if we did bring her off and everything else that we just described, that brings us to the magic number of 289 spaces. Exactly. <laughs> well, isn't that a coincidence? Thank you very much, Director Miller, and once again, thank you for being willing to make a plan for public uh, communicating effectively with the public and engaging the public. We're going to be doing that on Monday. And we'll be reporting out to the public about our plans after that. Uh, need to kind of proceed with the rest of our agenda. If you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about OpenGov. Uh, Councillor Moore and I uh, met with uh, David Spoladaro and Eric D. Eric D. Prospero on Monday to try to see if there was a way forward. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Jeff. I'm sorry, I, should, I probably should have told you I was going to hand it over to you. Okay, well, we, we spoke with them uh, on Monday, like uh, Councilor Armstrong said. Uh, we were try, uh, trying to get a meeting with uh, the mayor and uh, Councilor Kelly to uh, go over this to see what savings we could actually get, expect to get in the first year. To kind of try to pinpoint those so, more precisely, yes. Correct. So. Uh, uh, 
we're going to try and set up a meeting for next week. Uh, uh, Ms. Mayor, right. correct? That's so. Uh, you know, we'll see where that takes us. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, get more detail in our uh, deliberations on the budgets. Uh, it's a big question for me. Like, you know, is is the rec center making money? Uh, is the beach breaking even? You know, th th we are. You know, because I know I've heard in the past people mentioning, well, can we afford to keep this or that or whatever. I really think we should base our decisions on, on hard numbers and objective data rather than uh, just guessing. So anyway, this, this would help with that. Uh, but we do need to prove that it, it, it would be uh, a good, good fit for us. Right. So uh, myself, I, I am not the person to outline the details of this. So. Mr. Spoladino. Spoladaro and Spoladaro. Di Prospero, two good Italians from Massachusetts. Yes, anyway. they, they're going to answer, and I think both the mayor and Mike had very specific questions that they wanted answers to, and we spent that Monday trying to figure out, um, you know, the best kind of information that could be presented to you to address all of your concerns. So that's where we are. And uh, we'll probably be able to report out to you after that meeting has transpired. Very good. Yeah, very good. Thank you. And we don't have too much to say about the uh, community, uh, Climate Smart Community Task Force appointment and task force. Mayor and I have begun conversations about who might be uh, part of that task force. Mm -hmm. And you want to say anything? Right. And our council's trying to form it into creating another permanent committee. So we'll hopefully have language for next week on that. Okay. And uh, create an interim director as we, or coordinator as we discuss. That's right. Hopefully by next week that'll all be complete. Good, very good. All right, so I'd like to turn to the agenda items, which are uh, composed of 11 items. And I'll just briefly say, I mean, we could kind of fold this into the same system by which we proceed when we have a work session. Uh, do you want to go over it? Any item that you need to question or ask of any of the department heads at this point? Um, I'm not going to read the entire set. No. Um, do we know when? Would the you last cite the item you're referring to? Uh, I'm sorry. To? Yes, uh, item three, two, three. Mm -hmm. um, do we know when the last rate hike was for the beach? It's been just five years at least. Uh, yeah, it's been five years at least. Since I came on in 2003, I don't recall any rate changes. And Brian Nissen, the interim beach manager, said that he hadn't had any changes uh, before he retired either. It was pretty much this way as well. So we're looking at 20 plus years before there's been a rate hike? Yep. And we're looking at minimum wage, right? In a way, right on an basis that just got more no, no, I, I, I'm just yeah. curious when the last time sure. was. Yeah, I think it's important to look at it within that context. I really do. Um, I remember back in 2014, you know, we were trying to think of ways <coughs> to help supplement the rec complex stream of revenue, and I suggested what was heresy at the time. And that was that city residents pay a dollar to get in. And I was, I was told that that was just almost like heresy. But I'm going to just interject that possibility um, into the conversation. It doesn't need to be, we don't need to discuss it now. But I just wanted to interject. And do note that city and town residents do receive free passes. So if we did impose a fee on the city, the irony would be that we'd then still be, be required by our Falcon Seaboard agreement, which we're fulfilling to the town completely be free. to let the town residents in for free. So oh yeah, okay. I didn't I didn't enough. factor in that consideration. Thank you for telling me that. Okay. That's what um, I, I, I guess <laughs> why we're I don't know if this is a program why we're talking about the beach or not. How do we stand with our lifeguard staffing at this point? So we have, I believe it's two or three signed up thus far. We had two official leaves. And it was just a class <coughs> that finished at Plattsburgh State that we sent interim beach manager to address 
uh, the upcoming season. So that ended on Sunday. We're hoping this week we get more applicants, obviously. But we've been promoting heavily since the beginning of the year. And what's our hiring? <coughs> What, what do we need? What's our uh, bare bones level? We're shooting for eight, eight light bars with one headlight bar. Ideally 12, but eight would be great still. So. Eight, so eight with the, or eight nine plus with, one, eight nine plus one. Including the headlight bar. <laughs> Those six of you are good swimmers. Maybe you can jump in at the beach for the summer. So yeah, if any of the counselors know anybody who's certified who's looking for a summer job, please send them all the and what kind of advertising did you do to? Um, Justin could speak that right now. Yeah, we've called all the previous guards from the last five years. Uh, we had one that said they'd come back, that was it. We put ads out at SUNY Plattsburgh, Clinton Community College. Uh, Wonderful. Facebook ads. Great. Job sites posted on our webpage. We just put an ad in the Progressive Public and again. Uh, we had Brian missing that go to the SUNY class. And done indeed in Monster. All right, oh. thank you so much. Thorough job. Yeah. All right, any other item on the agenda that people would like to comment on or ask questions about? I just had a question on item number four. Okay. If you could, ex someone could explain to me what this is exactly. I can. I can. Oh, go ahead. I have some familiarity with it. Um, annually, this neighborhood um, conducts a black party, um, and it consists of probably anywhere up to 40 to 50 homes. And what they do is they will close off a, a section of Trafalgar for the eight hours and, um, to hold the block party. And so there the is still, the street is blocked off, but yet there is still um, traffic there's there's able for traffic can go through it's not completely cordoned off or blocked off to traffic there is access in and out of of the area okay any further questions um, the public may be a little bit interested in item five uh, uh, this is to do the pre-demolition hazardous material inspection for the MLD site uh, as part of our <coughs> overall plan and part of the Restore New York grant, million dollar grant that that um, uh, development um, chair uh, Miller is is pursuing. It'll take down what two buildings uh, of the uh, currently MLD have well, yeah, I think they're completely out of three out of five buildings now. Uh, we are doing a hazmat survey of the entire site. And then as the buildings become available for demolition, we're going to do it in a phase process, um, just so that the state sees that we are making progress on the grant and we're making good use of the money that they put towards the project. And we're relocating some of the employees to the uh, Miller Street. Yes, sir. We're relocating some of the employees around the existing MLD sites. It'll be require us to move some air conditioning units around and try and decide whether this is going to be for one summer or two. That depends on the success of the annexation and your building plans up there. So we're trying to juggle a fair number of uncertainties at the same time, but knowing also that the uh, state is anxious for us to completely restore New York grants, uh, MLD in your office has been most accommodating to try to get this done. Any further questions? I just had one, I had a, a few constituents mention this to me about people parking in front of fire hydrants and I noticed with the, uh, the painted markings, some, some of the hydrants are marked as the area where you're not supposed to park next to the hydrants. I, I wonder if there's any plans to do any of that. No, I'll have to defer. Yeah. The, the proposal currently out there is for rehabilitation of what we have currently existing in the city. So I don't think it's not to add any additional marking. There should be arrows, crosswalks. If there are some hydrants marked, that would be it. Also, there's that crazy green crosswalk that we down down like Georgia District. That's included. Uh, the pricing between the price. So at our discretion, we can take out our 
Mm -hmm. I hope the mic picked that up, Mike. We need a, a location for us, Council Row. Well, uh, this particular one was on Couch Street. Okay. This is for crosswalks? No, for fire hydrants. I guess people have been parking in, in front of one of those. Okay. And uh, it, it, is, it is hazardous to have those hydrants blocked if there is a, is a fire. The parking is congested there more than other areas because of the uh, number of rentals. But I mean, even if it's not painted, it's still well, it's net traffic law, state traffic law, that you can't park within 10 feet of a hydrant. So even if they're not painted, it's still state law. And I think that's question number two on the permit test. Apparently not everyone knows that. <laughs> Any further questions? If not, I'd like to entertain a motion to move items 1 through 11 to the agenda. I'll second that. I'll enter a motion. I guess I, yeah, yeah. and I'll second it. Councilor <laughs> Armstrong? Yes. Councilor McFarland? Yes. Mayor Reed? Yes. All right, and now it's time for old business regarding government operations and strategy. No? Okay, any new business? Okay, and then I would like to uh, move that we adjourn. Uh, so you're moving? I'm I'll moving. Second. Okay. okay. Councilor Armstrong? Yes. <clears throat> Councilor Farland? Yes. Mayor Reed? Yes. So we begin the work session at 12th and any additional conversation you'd like to have on issues on the agenda tonight? Oh uh, yes, I'll note for parking um, that uh, there are some things that are outside of the scope of the presentation that was given by the recommender and myself. There are certain aspects of uh, parking that I think uh, should be addressed by the council. Um, that the parking committee has kind of established that the, it's kind of outside their purview, at least in the emails um, they've expressed this. Uh, some would be uh, zoning code changes um, and other laws. Uh, Daniel Erb at the last parking committee meeting uh, brought up um, perhaps requiring, and she brought it up for the prime site specifically, but I think it's a good idea for all uh, city residences um, or apartments that provide uh, apartments, if they provide off street parking for um, their tenants. Tenants. that the price of that be decoupled from the price of their apartments. Mm -hmm. um, she was bringing up uh, evidence that um, mentioned that that might lower demand for parking um, by 20%. Uh, and that is backed by a, um, quite a bit of research. If you make people pay for something and they know they're paying for it, um, they might not invest in two cars instead of one if they don't need. Mm -hmm. um, but also it, it is cheaper for those people uh, and for our residents that are unfortunate enough to not be able to afford a car um, instead of their uh, the price of parking being spread out amongst everyone in their building um, to um, pay for everyone's parking. People that need parking will pay for it. People that don't use the parking won't pay for it. Um, there's uh, options like that even for um, um, employers. Uh, a, a lot of uh, municipalities has um, have done cash out parking systems where if uh, employers offer free parking uh, to any employees that don't <coughs> want to park, uh, don't want to decide not to drive or decide to carpool with others, um, the cost of parking would be paid out in cash to the employees that don't use the parking. I remember that idea from one of the articles. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's common in large cities. It's very common. Uh, it's, it's good policy. Uh, another would be um, getting rid of the parking minimum requirements in the zoning code. I, I have put, I've talked to people about the need, though, to have some uh, amount of parking for people to do their in and out of the store business without having to pay. But I know that's just a topic, and that's in the mix of consideration. Well, I could talk to you forever about. Okay, let's terms, talk forever, but not now. Yeah. Okay. I won't bring that up today. Pages We're out of my meeting, right? Okay. Yeah, we'll work session. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to make one quick request sure. to the council on the agenda committee meeting. If you guys have any questions on item 2 or item 11, uh, I asked a few members of the rec complex to be here. Um, and if you have any questions, I can tell them to head out. Okay. 
Yeah. I'm sorry, you said item two and two. No, two. two. I don't know, too. How's Wilcox Doc doing? Is it still under water right now? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wonderful. And I about would... to get even higher, I believe, after this week. Oh, my God. Really? Yeah, I don't, I don't have any further questions about them. What about you guys? Is there already an, a slip rental rate established, or is, is this changing one that's already in place? Or is this Wilcox Doc? No, because it's made so late. And no? Yeah, that's what's reasonable, though. So, oh, and I forgot to add, uh, this is bouncing back to what <coughs> Patrick said about some uh, Danielle Herb's comment regarding perhaps new zoning restrictions. Well, she was decoupling, but. Decoupling, yeah. whatever. Uh, someone suggested to me that we might consider, because of the concern for the, t the truck <coughs> traffic, and unloading, sometimes double parking, to uh, create some time restrictions uh, about when deliveries can be made. I guess in some urban areas that is a practice. So I think it would be worthwhile to just investigate how that might work for us. It might not be a bad idea. I mean, I think I, I personally have experienced times like when just I'm trying to turn from Upper Bridge onto Margaret and I run smack dab into uh, a truck. That's really unsafe, and sometimes I feel like I'm taking my life in my hands just to see whether or not I can get around and without crashing into somebody. But, and so that's generally something that might even work now, but most especially if uh, you know there are concerns about parking and congestion as a result of the Jerky Street lot development. Yeah. Um, Related to that, uh, this is just a thought, but like um, we have on the south side, uh, south side of Bridge Street, we have um, on the north side and the south side, we have these little square pe places for people to sit. The south side has basically been storage for bikes. Perhaps um, getting rid of those and making that a loading and unloading zone. Well, yeah, for, I mean, uh, those cars. are really underutilized. Yeah, that might be worth. I mean, it's a nice idea. I hate to get rid of a place where people might be able to get some public use from it, but I mean, if we were to collect the data on it, I, I wonder how many bikes we would see that are parked there ever, right? I think they were designed to be originally kiosks for vendors, which never has right. materialized. Okay. And one of those two lanes on Bridge you're referring to is actually declared a, a temporary parking unloading loading zone that principle of that was to get them from stopping them from double parking on Durkee and Bridge Streets uh, because they were clogging up traffic sometimes all the way around the corner and up the street. So the uh, police have been enforcing double parking and asking them to instead park on one of those two lanes on Bridge Streets. So that's why that is occurring. Actually, I did have a question uh, regarding item two. On the, Justin, uh, the $47 uh, per foot uh, docking um, fee, how does that relate or compare to uh, the, um, I guess, the private uh, marinas and also what we charge down on Dock Street? Uh, Scott Dubray can answer that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Scott. That's all right. So basically, uh, all the docks around the area are anywhere from 70 to about $85 a foot, um, considering the Wilcox. It's going to be a smaller slip, 28 slips only. Um, and it's only a 26 foot or low um, that can house the boat. So it's kind of a smaller boat slip. So basically, that's what we can set the So Okay, great. Thank you. And what about for with us on dot with our, do we have, I can't recall if we actually rent out slips on Dock Street or is that? Just uh, individual yeah. use. Yeah, Dock Street, we're up at 85 right now, and we're pretty maxed out with this. So, okay. So we're pretty good against the season. And that's competitive with what Correct. the private docking fees are? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And our hope for Wilcox Dock is really kind of the people's dock for people, smaller boats, mm -hmm. especially city residents who really don't have an opportunity given the higher prices to dock on our dock street marina are we going to keep some docks uh empty i mean if there's the demand <coughs> excuse me we have an excess of demand but are we still going to keep some docks open for people that may just want to 
come in and go out or temporarily, or are we going to try to rent every single dock or every single slip? Uh, from my understanding, we're going to rent every one. There's still some free space, I think, over on the other side of World Cups, correct? Um, just if somebody wants to drop back or Right. So okay. there's still some free spots that will be over on the North Shore on World Cups. Okay, great. Thank you. I had uh, some questions for uh, both directors from infrastructure. <laughs> So we're getting some emails about um, questioning the frequency of the pickup for the lawn and the leaf bags. Is there, it, does the frequency fall in line with whenever the garbage pickup is yeah, for we'll that? Yeah, we we'll try to use that frequency. Okay. And I had some photographs that I showed the mayor the other day that where people are putting garbage on it. It takes a long time to pick it up. Mm -hmm. It's a tremendous amount of leaves and bags. We have to take the landfill, we got to unload them, and then we got to go back and start picking so I did some research, because we talked about this last week in the council about um, plastic bags. And if uh, Governor Cuomo moves towards the, the plastic bag ban, and we had talked about, well, what would that mean for people who like to use the plastic bags for their lawn and leaf? And I did some research, and there are actually lots of options out there for compostable biodegradable ba bags. So that would bypass that concern altogether, and they seem pretty reasonable, and they're they're available at Amazon, Sam's Club, Lowe's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, yeah. We some of yeah. Mm -hmm. So we were just kind of anticipating, like if, if we went towards that, especially with everything you're trying to get going with the Climate Smart community, if we made that resolution here, we want to make sure that we have information and, and resources available. Right, but can I just ask a question, though, Mike? I don't mean to interrupt, but the original question was, uh, why can't paper bags currently be used? And, and someone had yeah, tried so to they, anticipate. They, yeah, they're being used now. Oh, they, they are. So yeah, there's no, no they are, restriction. but I think, I thought I remembered you, Mike, because I was the one that brought that. I thought okay. I remembered you saying something about they do take an awful long time to. You have, we're looking into that now. We have, you have to scrub the bag itself. You can't just leave the bag to leave in it. It takes forever. It's up to a year. So you have to shred it. So it would be better if people used compostable bags then. But even they're compo even though they're compostable, we, what we have to currently do is we pick the leaves up, whether it's in a paper bag or a plastic bag, we bring it to the, our, our dump site. We have, if it's a plastic bag, we physically have to open every bag, mm -hmm. dump them, and take the bags away. Uh, the pe problem with paper bags is they aren't breaking down quick enough, so they would have to be repeatedly turned probably by a mechanism. Yeah, that's what I, I. But what if you just emptied them and then retained the plastic bags and this? I mean, the uh, paper bags and disposed well, we them. We're currently we do some of those depending on the yeah. picker, but for the most part, we're, we're trying to just rip the bag and leave the paper. Yeah, bag yeah, okay. But I mean, I think it's important to note to this. Personally, the person who contacted me thought that they were disallowed, so they're not. No. Okay. But you be right around the city a little bit. You see a whole bunch of them. Okay. But the city picks them up at the same time they would pick up normal garbage? We attempt to, but for the sheer volume that we have, um, we we'll follow the same route, and then when we get our people back off the garbage truck, we actually throw additional people into the rotation. We had three days last week where we actually concentrated strictly on garbage and picking leaves. And what most people can see is we already made a dent in That's the volume. And after this weekend, with warm weather, we'll be up against it again. Yeah. Um, I think we put in excess of 10 people out one day last week. Is there any Now, do we do pick up, I'm sorry. sorry, do we do pick up of uh, lawn waste and so on, despite, even if they are not customers of the gar our garbage pickup or? The leaf pickup we do citywide. Citywide leaf, okay. Okay, and maybe there's some information we can put out there. I see a few gardeners in the audience about how individuals can use lawn and leaf clippings as part of a larger composting campaign so that we don't, it doesn't end up something that we have to collect for them. It can be done if you have a yard. I guess there is that. You have to have a yard and you have to know how to compost. But, you know, that could alleviate the burden a little bit if, if we tried to educate the public as to how. Yes? One reason why I like clear plastic bags is you can see what's in the bag. Oh, Sorry. people try to sneak in other things? Well, there's a lot of other things. Uh, <laughs> needles that was the one big thing we had years ago. Oh. Wow. Pine, Pine needles. needles? Pine needles? Pine needles. No. no. Hypodermic. Oh, oh, my goodness. Mm. 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 Mm.
Right. Well, we just need to make that appeal for people to be conscientious and have civic pride. If there's nothing else, let's uh, begin the meeting at 530 today. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Mayor hey, Reed. Present. Councilor Armstrong. Here. Councilor Kelly. Here. Councilor Gibbs. Here. Councilor Ensel. Here. Councilor McFarland. Here. Councilor Moore. Here. I do want to begin uh, the meeting with a proclamation. Uh, res resolve that I, Colin L. Reed, Mayor of the City of Plattsburgh, proclaim this week to be dedicated Employee Week in honor of Brad Miller for his excellent work over the past six months at the City of Plattsburgh's uh, Police Department's Downtown Community Resource Center. The center, located at 79 Market Street, opened in early November 2018. It's funded for a 12-month pilot program using asset forfeiture money. Officer Miller has worked tirelessly to secure grants, host community events, and even helped a stranded traveler from France that gained some notoriety in the paper. Thank you. The city thanks and honors community resource officer Brad Miller for his extraordinary imagination and contribution to community policing and the fabric of our downtown. So I think you'd like to say a few words. <laughs> There's just a short video, it's about four minutes long, I just want people to see. Um, every time I see it, it brings a smile to my face. Um, it's only a couple months into the program. Chief Ritter had a vision of um, getting closer to our community and be more engaging. And let me tell you something, it's working. Um, it's exploded. We've networked, um, working together, establishing partnerships. So it's not just a bridge that was gapped. We've actually bonded and formed strong relationships. And if you follow our Plastic City Police Facebook page, you'll see a lot of the stories that um, I just captured the moment. And with Chief Ritter's permission, it's, it, uh, it's getting put out there in the public. So I don't know if these people want to see the video or have a great compliment. <laughs> Everybody's reaching for something Every day pulling and tugging And always wanting a little more Holding on Treating those we love like strangers 
you, everybody, but I just want to, uh, I started writing a list of people that have been involved in the community center, um, whether it's corporations, small businesses, or individuals, and I got up to 50, and I didn't have time to say everybody, but there's some familiar faces. Carol Arnold's been great. Um, she's really helped us out with the Explorer program. I've worked with the Gender Alliance, um, Classroom State University, CBPH, um, and I, I just I want to thank Chief Ritter for having the opportunity to promoting a, a program that you can't go wrong. It's a win-win situation. Um, 90 to 100 percent of my job now is is positive. And if you guys understood, uh, being 17 years of being a policeman on the road, um, <coughs> 10 years of it being night shift. You know, you see some of the things that I wish I would have never seen, but I can't get out of my head. And those are negative things, things that people don't want to talk about. The suicide, the drug epidemic, the mental health, um, you know, the, the child abuse. Those things do go on. And uh, we as a department are very professional and we um, handle the things that are very bad. But when you have an opportunity like this um, to serve the community, at a higher level, um, it's a good feeling. I go home with a smile on my face every day, and I just want to thank Chief River for, for actually starting this program. Um, the Explorers, we just had training with the FBI and um, the U.S. Marshals, and two of them decided to come here today because they're young men and women that want to get involved in our community, and they've helped out with uh, Earth Day cleanup, with VHSM, the Behavioral Health Services North uh, community event that was over at the City Rec, and the mayor was kind enough to come over and... and uh, Would you mind introducing them to sure. us? Sure. This is uh, Matt Lattenville. Would you stand, please? Matt Lattenville? Matt Lattenville. Uh, he's 18 nice years old. He's a uh, student at Peru High School. Uh, nice to meet you. He played football. He does golf. And um, he's, been, he's been with the Explore program since we opened. And this right here is Kiara Maggie. Kara's 15, and she goes to Plattsburgh High School. And I don't want to call them kids because they're going into young adulthood. So it's been awesome. I appreciate Mary you inviting me here and um, getting a chance to show a video and speaking to you guys. I have a lot of passion behind it, so I will take the the batteries out of the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys have any questions, feel free. But I'm down at 79 Margaret Street. Um, set the doors locked. I have a business card if anybody wants one. I usually have the phone on 24 7. So if anybody wants to talk, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I'm sure we can work things out. And Thank you. Sounds like to see how I feel like I'm being blessed by it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say uh, I've been very impressed with the um, community outreach that post. Mm -hmm. uh, Chief, I tip my hat to you, uh, Officer Miller, very well. Um, the Explore program has been great. Um, in that slide, um, he had a picture of that young man, uh, the young student from France uh, that uh, Officer Miller was able to help out, and that's exactly what I was hoping to see um, from that outpost, and uh, I, I couldn't be happier with the way it's going. It's like we're creating a whole new batch of Academy members someday, too, so that's really <laughs> wonderful. Well, thanks again. Thank you, Chief, for your vision as well. Please continue. Resolved that the minutes of the regular meeting of the Common Council held on April 25th, 2019 are approved and placed on file among the public records of the City Clerk's Office. Moved by Councilor Rensel, second by Councilor Gibbs. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. <coughs> Resolved that the payrolls of the various departments of the City of Plattsburgh for the week ending May 1st, 2019, in the amount of $99,078.40, are authorized and allowed, and the Mayor and the City Clerk are hereby empowered and directed to sign warrants from the City Chamberlain for the payment thereof. Moved by Councillor Kelly, second by Councillor Ansel. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Pass. We've got the routine reports in your package. Is there anything 
In addition to offer, beginning with governance strategy and city operations, Councilor Armstrong? Yes, we had our meeting today and I'd asked for a report on the DRI and including the Ricky Street parking lot <coughs> and parking planning uh, from Director Miller. And if you wish to see uh, that, it's going to be archived in our um, videos. But uh, what what I requested of Director Miller was that he publish that outline on uh, the city website. It gives a timetable of how everything will proceed with the prime development, all of the reviews that will go through, and so forth. Um, and I also asked Director Miller to supply us with any updates uh, should they arise or any, any news uh, that comes from any of those kind of steps. Uh, he also told me, and I was gratified to hear, that uh, a meeting concerning how to address public outreach regarding this uh, process was going to be held, and I was invited, um, uh, Monday at 11 o'clock. Uh, I hope that from that we can communicate more effectively, um, and I look forward to that. So thank you very much. We also talked about parking to a great extent. We, um, you know, I think the, the message that we really all wanted to present was that this is a process. We're engaged in the first part of the process, that as we proceed, we are going to be doing our homework, making the best selections, vetting our choices, running them by engineers, doing what we need to do that in order to be responsible for the, for the effective transition from Durkee Street to the other kinds of parking options that eventually will come. Um, and we talked about OpenGov, a software that will uh, make our budgeting easier and our budget, budget pro more pro transparent to the public and more accessible to counselors. And I think that's as much as I can remember. I think you, uh, the team is producing uh, websites to let the better inform the public, uh, keep them updated of all the various touchstones. I think that you counted 18 or 20 different public policy <coughs> touchstones, both in parking and in the Durkee Street uh, development to date. And uh, people should be cognizant of where we've come from, as well as where we're going to now in that documentation has already been there, but they're trying to make it as accessible as they possibly can. Well, and I also want all of us, you know, I've been trying to reach out to people from various uh, neighborhoods and walks of life and of various points of view, and I think that we could probably step up our efforts to try to make ourselves available. I know I, have, I, I haven't had that much feedback come to me in my emails. Uh, and, or, you know, much representation as it comes up to the podium. And we need more of that. We need more vigorous interaction, and I encourage that. Thank you. Next uh, city infrastructure, Councillor Moore. Well, I just want to remind everyone we go closer to uh, paving season, and there's always some of the problems there. And I, I just wanted to remind everybody about the, the marathon this Sunday, which I always end up getting stuck in because I forget. So I'm more reminding myself that uh, there, will, there will be some <coughs> traffic holdups uh, Sunday morning. Thank you. And I think the, uh, the awards for the marathon are uh, somewhere around 11 o'clock on Sunday morning at the rec center. The rec center, as always, is chipped into this event so people can come out and either run or recognize the runners. That'd be wonderful. Finance and budget, uh, Councillor Kelly. Well, I mentioned last week that uh, it is nearly time for us to produce, uh, that is the council to produce our uh, 2020 uh, update to our five-year plan. Mm -hmm. And this is a very exciting time for me. I don't get excited about too many things, but I get excited about a balanced budget, keeping uh, our tax rate below the uh, governor's tax cap is another important thing. Um, making sure that we deliver services to our city that are both excellent and affordable. So I'm going to enlist the help of all of you to help us achieve those goals. We always start the process with a, uh, a statement of our assumptions. and. 
I will send you uh, last year's assumptions and see if you would like to add any additional assumptions and uh, also send you a copy of the current five-year plan so that we can begin to plan for the, uh, the next five-year plan. It's a very exciting time. Uh, one of the reasons why it is exciting is that we then turn our five-year plan over to the mayor and he and his uh, manager develop a, a budget for the city and that will come to us probably late, later in the summer and we look forward to that also. So, well, great things happening. I always think that, you know, that there's some wonderful things that happen here in the city, the DRI being one of them, the parking issues, those are all really exciting exciting things but delivering a balanced budget to the taxpayers that stays below the tax cap is also a really exciting thing too and i certainly look forward to it and i hope i can get you excited about it also thank you well thanks for embarking on that we had some heavenly music to keep you <laughs> i do feel inspired <laughs> Public Safety Counselor Gibbs. So uh, we met before our meeting, um, uh, Chief Ritter and Counselor Ansel and I, and we're still continuing to work on the animal control contract and we're hoping that we've, all, we've got some research, we're gonna look into a few things, um, and then we're gonna regroup again next week to continue to discuss that. I also wanted to take the opportunity to recognize um, Supervisor Joe McMahon, um, there's a considerable amount of noise coming into my ward from the industrial park across the river. And he has been so, I'm sorry he's not here to hear this, but he's been so diligent about visiting the people there, uh, going into their actual homes to hear the noise. He's tried to mitigate the problem with some solutions and he's just been really um, very diligent about that. I'm very impressed and very thankful for that. Um, and that's all that I have. He's also um, acquired a sound pressure level meter calibrated, specially calibrated one to enforce the noise code that you recently passed, and he's been starting to deploy that too. We actually had a question uh, yesterday, uh, Councilor Moore and I met with our subcommittee, if you will, of the <coughs> livable community group, and um, I knew that we purchased one that we had, bless you, in the, with the building inspector's office. Just wondering if would the question came up, were some also purchased for the police department for enforcement purposes? No, their standard is um, a sort of a reasonable person standard that, they, that is also in the code that they've been exercising. Okay. But I'm sure if they ever needed to avail it, it would be available to them. Yeah. Would it, I mean, I guess, would it be worthwhile to maybe even just get one additional one for the police department if, if the case was ever needed I mean over the weekend or something when the building inspector's office isn't open or wouldn't have access to it I, I don't know I'm just speaking really on behalf of the subcommittee that raised the question they can just take it over the weekend right? well but you never know if an incident comes up we could certainly anyway. make sure it's kept in a place where they would have access yeah okay to it. That, that's fine I think I'm just mm -hmm. is that correct Jeff I mean that's yeah. pretty much what was discussed at some point. We're happy that we have a way, an objective way to, to study the noise and uh, be able to take action, yeah. It's, so people are out there thinking about it. <laughs> Thank you. Plattsburgh Public Library, Council Um You'll see on the agenda a little bit later on um, the appointment of Leah Sweeney to the uh, library board. And MLD Board President Councilman McFarland. Uh, yes, I did have a chance to meet with um, Bill Tracy earlier today and the mayor, and um, he informed me that uh, the right array analysis seems to be working out pretty well. Um, customers' uh, PPAC, which is their extra um, that they're charged, typically uh, in their electric bills, stays about 0.7. Um, cents a kilowatt hour, which is typically what it is throughout the year. Uh, when we go over our quota amount, it can rise up to over one cent per kilowatt hour, or even up to even a little higher than that. Uh, Rider A was to uh, have that extra cost um, be spread out towards high density load bearers or cryptocurrency miners. Um, so their, their electric uh, PPAC went up by over two cents. 
Um, but uh, throughout the entire winter, our PPAC for our uh, regular residential residents uh, stayed around um, 0 .7 cents per kilowatt hour, um, which I, I think is a great, um, a great result. Um, there has been some litigation uh, with the Public Service Commission and the, uh, the cryptocurrency miners. Um, so far, it hasn't brought any sucker to the cryptocurrency miners. Uh, so, um, and despite lifting the moratorium, uh, Mr. Tracy told me today that we haven't had any more cryptocurrency uh, mining operations brought in, and actually one of the two is not really in operation anymore. Um, so fears about that have, uh, at least so far, um, not manifested. Uh, so that's good news thus far. So do watch your bills. There is still a small PPAC charge for our residents. And how that is calculated is they look at the overall energy usage, remove what is caused by just that industry, the HDL, high density load users. See if without that industry, whether we still would have gone over the quota. We did a little bit this winter, so there's a small <coughs> PPAC charge. Then they add that amount from the high density load users into the formula again, recalculate, and the entire difference is then applied just to that industry as a PPAC. And actually, the number's somewhere on 3.7 since they were paying a higher PPAC charge than their standard electric charge. This in the last couple of bills. So it seems like the uh, MLD was very successful in getting the Public Service Commission to adopt uh, a rate a strategy that is protecting our rate payers as if that industry wasn't uh, affecting their bills. But it doesn't mean that there isn't a PPAC charge on occasion, especially cold winter months. Thank you. And I also invited you, uh, we'll be having the, the executive director of the, uh, of the municipal association we all belong to, to come up and address us uh, in about a week and a half. And at that time, we're gonna talk about some of the energy initiatives, solar, conservation, the IEEP program we described last week, and some other ideas, including putting more um, charging stations out for public access and that kind of stuff as well. So uh, we'll get you that date. Perfect, thank you. If there's no other reports, resolve the reports as lists are hereby ordered, received, and any written reports are placed on file among the public records of the city clerk's office, moved by Councillor Kelly and second by Councillor Gibbs. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Passed. No correspondence or recommendation from boards at this time. Please continue. Resolved that the bill is allowed by the Common Council for the week ending May 3rd, 2019 in the amount of $629,816.53 are authorized and allowed the Mayor and the City Clerk are hereby authorized and directed to sign warrants for the City Chamberlain for the payment thereof. Moved by Councilor Ansel, seconded by Councilor Kelly. Discussion? Yes, Mayor. Uh, we have bills that need to be signed today, Councilor, so would you please? If you don't mind passing <laughs> that. Thank you. So it's moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Passed. There's agendas just outside the door if you don't already have one. This is an opportunity now for the individuals from the public to please come and address the council. And I was on the agenda tonight. There will be another opportunity to address the council at the end of the meeting for general issues of mutual concern. So this is for agenda items only. Okay. Seeing none, let's continue. Motion to remove item 7A from the table. Uh, I, would, I would like to uh, remove uh, this resolution from the table at this time. I'm, I'm happy it has created a lot of lively discussion. Uh, we continue to discuss this, but I, I really don't feel like we should leave it on the table for week after week, we will continue to uh, try to resolve the issue. And uh, But I, I think it's going to take a little longer to uh, discuss this with everyone, so I would like to do that. So, As the original mover of the resolution, you would then have the right to withdraw the resolution from the table. Uh, I would like to do that at this time. Second. 
don't think it even requires a vote. That's not good. I'd like to hand down this time the appointment of Leah Sweeney to the library board for the term of May 3rd, 2019 to June 30th, 2023, as introduced by Councillor Ensel earlier. Roll call. Councillor Armstrong? Yes. Councillor Kelly? Yes. Councillor Gibb? Yes. Councillor Ensel? Yes. Councillor McFarland? Yes. Councillor Moore? Yes. Resolved in accordance with the request, therefore the Common Council approves a slip rental rate of $47 per foot per season be implemented on May 3rd, 2019. For all boats docking at the city's Wilcox Dock Marina facility. Moved by Councillor Armstrong, second by Councillor McFarlane. <coughs> Discussion? Roll call. Councillor Armstrong? Yes. Councillor Kelly? Yes. Councillor Gibbs? Yes. Councillor Ensel? Yes. Councillor McFarlane? Yes. Councillor Moore? Yes. Resolved in accordance with the request. Beth, I'd like to waive a reading and move the resolution, please. Do you want to D or the other ones we discussed in the work session as well. I'll just say D. D through D. E. Okay. Moved by Councillor McFarland, second by Councillor Ensel. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Discussion of the item itself. And for the benefit of the public, uh, these have been discussed during work session just a few moments ago. Um, well, we heard in the work session that uh, it's been 20 years roughly since there's been a rate increase. Mm -hmm. This rate increase seems pretty minor. Um, I didn't hear any, uh, there's no public comment against it. Um, so I think with 20 years and such a minor rate increase, I, I don't see it as problematic. And for clarity, this does not affect uh, residents of the city of Plattsburgh nor the town of Plattsburgh, who we also provide passes to as a part of our policy and seaboard agreement. Any further discussion? Roll call. Councilor Armstrong? Yes. Councilor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Gibbs? Yes. Councilor Ensel? Yes. Councilor McFarland? Yes. Councilor Moore? Yes. Resolved in accordance with the request, therefore the Common Council approves Seth Silver of 40 Trafalgar Drive to close down part of Trafalgar Drive on June 8th. I'd like to make a motion to waive the reading of resolutions E through L. Moving forward. Is there a second? And most Is of them were discussed. Second? Most of them were discussed. Is there a second for Councilor Council's motion? Second by Councilor Malore. All in favor of waiving the reading? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Unopposed, yeah. Four in favor, two opposed. Two waiving two is. Opposed. Discussion on the items themselves. So we can discuss anything of mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some discussion took place uh, during the committee meeting, some during the um, work session. It's all on tape. But I gotta say, I'm pretty excited for the Polish corner um, mm -hmm. <laughs> to be at the beach. Uh, they've been at the farmers market, and it's they're good. It's amazing, <laughs> yeah. So I, I definitely recommend if you're at the beach to check that out. I think uh, Director Miller and his team have been very successful in attracting some really high quality vendors this year. That's really nice to see as well. Yeah, we should have a full house in the this year. Excellent. I would just like to say I'm very happy that uh, the uh, foundation of CVPH has decided to hold their annual gala <coughs> at our harbor side. Uh, that's a splendid uh, place to hold any event. It's beautiful there on the lake, especially in the summer. And uh, they could have had this event anywhere in the county, and they have in the past. Had it in numerous venues, but they, they had it there last year. Last year they had it. Last year they, had it. they chose the city again this year, so I, I'm grateful for that. And uh, everybody who attends that event will get to see what a beautiful place it is uh, we have at the waterfront. So I think last year weather didn't quite cooperate too well. The other thing they're willing to do, as you recall, last year they had it in the marina parking lot, and we did receive some concerns over disruption of the pattern of people trying to use that marina they've been willing to move that over into the uh, grassy area in between the two large parking lots for this year 
And this is consistent with an idea that many of you have had to try to do more activities like this down on Harborside. DPW is working to make that grassy area more attractive and more multi-use. It has been used for want of any other better use, just as overload parking at times for people with boats and their trailers and stuff. But we're asking them to actually use the assigned parking areas and create a nice space for that. We're also, uh, Director Miller is uh, embarking on grant writing to come up with a master plan for that area as well. And uh, we hope to see some major new features that could be put down there perhaps as early as, as next year as a consequence of that plan. So please keep thinking of how we can really better employ that area. It's been a large part of the DRI, as you know, was the part of the DRI that wasn't funded much. They gave us a little bit of money to do some research for what could be down there, but they didn't give us any money to actually do, create any plans or any, um, bring any projects to fruition down there. So it's still very much a work in progress, but I know your team is very excited and Amy Bond has been retained to help develop some plans for down there as well to hear a lot more about it. And I'm sure uh, Director Miller would appreciate your ideas. Any further discussion? Seeing none, roll call. Councillor Armstrong? Yes. Councillor Kelly? Yes. Councillor Gibbs? Yes. Councillor Ensel? Yes. Councillor McFarland? Yes. Councillor Moore? Yes. <coughs> no trouble request this time. Are there any resolutions for initial consideration? New business or additional council reports, please. I just want to say that, um, you know, I, I said similar things before, but I just want to say it again. Um, I've tried to take the opportunity to listen to people over the last uh, week or so, engaged in conversations on Facebook through private messaging. Uh, people have reached out to me more so than ever. Uh, um, and I, I, I want to take more opportunities like that, and I encourage us all to, and I know you do, but I just want to encourage us all to, uh, you know, kind of increase the level of our engagement with our neighbors. Um, and again, I want to thank uh, Matt and his team for the opportunity to think about how we can increase uh, and, uh, yeah, accelerate our efforts for public outreach um, regarding how all the changes are going to go down with uh, downtown revitalization. And uh, that reminds me, Michelle, uh, public outreach. One thing we want we discussed about discussing in the community, uh, or sorry, the city operations and strategies committee meeting was um, that I had a member of the public uh, request that we talk about perhaps delaying the start time of council meetings. Um, oh, yeah. I had forgotten all about it. Um, I brought it up, I think, last week during a new business. Yeah, you did. Uh, but there was a request to perhaps uh, move back council meetings um, instead of starting at 5.30, I imagine 6 or 6.30. Mm -hmm. um, uh, her opinion was that uh, I, I think it's because she works and couldn't get here on time, mm -hmm. um, although that's just speculation on my part. Uh, I could see that as being a, a valuable thing. I, I suppose there's a competing interest the other way, especially for our city employees. Um, staying here longer might be very taxing. Um, I don't really have a position on it myself. But, right, um, but you'd like to, for you know, take the conversation a step further. It okay. was brought up. Yeah. All right. Any other new business or additional council reports? Well, I just wanted to comment that we had our first uh, rural community uh, meeting this past week, or week before, and this week we had broken into uh, three different subgroups, and uh, we had uh, we've all met on that also. I'm very pleased with all the people that are on there. You know, Councillor Ensel is, it, it attended also, and uh, the people are very very engaged in their. Uh, have some really good ideas. I think you know this is going to be have some really good uh, things that we could probably put into uh, motion. So, um, 
happy so far. It's very good. And then, uh, Mayor Reed was at uh, <coughs> also, so he gets got to hear all the uh, things, and we have lots of new ideas now that we'll bring next week for our next meeting. You've also got a very technologically savvy committee. Uh, this room is not really conducive to small group meeting space or presentation space. It's designed nicely for council meetings. So we are trying to create a, a better space for you in the former chambers that could be more multi-use, put some technology in there so you can do Skyping and video oh, casting and that sort of stuff as well. And will then encourage many groups as possible who would like to use those facilities. I know you did a teleconference today. One of your members was in Florida. Yes, and thank, thank you very much for allowing us to do that. It, it worked out very well. Terrific. Any other new business or council reports? Seeing none, this is now an opportunity for any members of the public to please come forward and share any issues of mutual concern. Thank you very much for the time. My name is Doug Buttdorf. I live at 64 Trafalgar Drive. There is an item agenda that I want to talk about, and that's thank you for approving the uh, our block party. Uh, the one for Trafalgar. It's going to be fun. Come on by. It's a good time every year. Um, I specifically wanted to say thank you for putting together some thinking about uh, better strategic communication regarding the Turkey Street uh, community uh, investment and the uh, overall DRI project. I think it's really important. There's been a lot of miscommunication. Uh, there's been a lot of dis misunderstanding of uh, historical uh, reality, and uh, it is what it is. So uh, I think it's really important that we invest the time and energy into better communicating that as much as possible. I would ask that uh, the council and the uh, city's uh, team consider really clearly communicating what the public's return on investment is uh, for the, uh, you know, for the public's uh, share in this public-private partnership. So this is an investment uh, development, right? Whereby the public is investing dollars, not only the $4 million associated to the DRI grant, but also <laughs> the value of the property uh, at some value that we could consider it could be whatever that happens to be, uh, as well as the cost of lost revenue associated to the term of the pilot. So if we could look at and articulate those, those investments and we identify what that amount of money is that the public is investing in this public-private partnership, and then it would be a great idea if, if we could communicate to the public what that return on investment is. So the public's making this commitment. What then is the return on the investment? We see it in you know, improved traffic. You know, there's a whole bunch of ways that it can be communicated. But I would suggest that we just work on communicating that and clearly identifying for us, the public, what our investment in this public-private partnership is from a financial perspective. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank, thank you, Doug. Yeah. Oh, Jamie Young, and so many folks know me. Uh, and thanks for the service, Brad and we're going to continue to work together. Um, I'm here to uh, talk about a couple of things um, that Colin and I discussed yesterday. Um, first is um, something that I started doing to, um, as a project that uh, Joel McNichol and I we're discussing, and that was to take the uh, Air Base Museum into the schools. But in the due course of that, I started to um, do what I call deep dive research, starting off with the um, Press Republican from 1950 to 1995. And um, this research covers many areas, um, starting off in 1951, when, and I'll let you folks see this, when the then Senator, I, I think his name is, since that, um, which was one of the uh, processes 
that was starting to get the Air Force into Plattsburgh. Um, at the time, also, there was the Plattsburgh Air Force Base Liaison Commission, headed up by Clyde Lewis and the uh, mayor at the time, Terrell, were uh, heavily working on that. So, and that made me start to think about doing a complete, you can say, history of the air base and Plattsburgh itself. How the um, air base influenced everything in the city and the town, but also how the city in the beginning started to struggle with this whole new influx of residents and students. Um, at the time, when the base became active in 1955, they were expecting about a thousand base personnel to show up, and there was no base housing. And all the students coming with their parents. So, but also at the time, General Chris Lemay was pushing all SAC installations get active. So, and throughout that 40 year, year period, there have been events both here in Plattsburgh that affected everybody, but also those that um, were global that affected here, like the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and when I was going to locating grants for the Gender Alliance, I came across this grant. It's for the category of funding is <coughs> humanities. I'll let you all see this. And it's for research into historical uh, areas, one being the military. And the grant I personally cannot get. It has to be done through either a city or a town or an <coughs> educational institute. <coughs> so that's where I stand with that. Regardless, I will continue to do the research. The other thing that um, Colin and I discuss, and I appreciate your support on it is to um, next year there will be the 65th anniversary of when the base became active and the 25th anniversary of when the base closed. Mm -hmm. What I am starting to work on and I'm going to be getting a group of uh, former base personnel involved in is to do right now what I'm calling a base cookout at the Oval, which will require for the Oval to be completely shut down for that event. And right now, I do not have a date set. But uh, the council will be tough to price of it, along with uh, Brad and the Chief. Perfect. So that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? We'll certainly get you to coordinate with our new community engagement coordinator who helps with events. As a matter of fact, I'd like to introduce him this time. This is Scott Matthews. For those mm -hmm. of you who haven't had a chance to meet him yet, uh, but he can certainly work with you on that as well as the various other <coughs> events mm -hmm. and outreach activities we've been working on. I know a number of people in the community have already met him, and you met him in my office right. uh, right. as well. And so we'll work together. Okay. Thanks, Jim. And um, I appreciate if you guys would take the uh, grant in consideration. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for your research. And as happens close to the event, if you want to take explorers on board, more than area. Absolutely. Thank and you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Any Jim, other individuals you like your, to? Um, your articles? Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Where is that? All right. Okay. Um, would you like to have uh, this to uh, hold on to? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other individual like to please come address the council this evening? Mm -hmm. Kevin Sage from 62 Club Road. I'd like to talk about the Crate Center. And basically, I don't know if anyone's ever been over there on a like a weeknight during the winter time, about 4 or 5 o'clock. About the past year and a half or so, I started working with uh, a, a soccer team of kids, CH kids, who are serving like you know, just a hundred kids in their group alone, and then you're in there on any given weeknight, and the crate tenders are serving hundreds of kids a day in the wintertime. I walked into this, and I hadn't been involved in city soccer <coughs> since I played it, and I was just absolutely amazed to see that, like, how much the space is actually being used, especially in places where the kids don't have any place to get any physical activity in the wintertime. So, to see that happening there kind of caught me off guard, and, uh, I was like, this pretty much looks like a soccer mecca in here when you come in. <laughs> so, um, you know, me as a resident here, I was not aware of actually how many people that was serving. And uh, so, just taking a moment to say that whatever's going on is good over there. And I'm not sure who's organizing what, but they're doing a, a good job. And it's something that you should keep an eye on because it's actually getting a lot of use. And I know that Plattsburgh State. I remember as a child being involved in the city youth soccer programs in Plattsburgh State was always like very involved with whatever was going on. And I, if I remember correctly, Plattsburgh State donated the the turf or something yeah. maybe out at the Cray Center. Possibility. Um, so there'd always been a lot of crowd, cross connection. I always remember the city as a child having a strong like soccer program, you know. And I'm not sure of the state of it today. But as I <laughs> sit back and I look what goes on in the world and Every time I see money going towards um, <clears throat> recovering addicts or adults with drug problems, I think about, boy, how irresponsible adults. You're taking money away from the children. Every dollar we spend on a broken adult is a dollar we're taking away from a healthy child. And, you know, when I'm looking around and I see, like, how do you solve these things? And I see Andrew Wiley's off, like, very involved in soccer programs and other things like that. So in our community, it's like a very safe way no head injuries, you know what I'm saying? It's not football, you're putting your head down and hitting people. So there's good things going on over there at the crate, and I uh, just kind of got my eyes open to it this winter. So that's that. Big question. <laughs> <laughs> Any other individuals like to please come address the council? Good evening, uh, Mayor Reed, council. My name is Renee McFarland. I'm the executive director of the County of Clinton Industrial Development Agency. Um, I was asked to attend tonight and present information pertaining to prime companies' uh, request for tax benefits in furtherance of their proposed Derby Street project. I want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present tonight um, and share this with you. I have been able to conduct similar presentations to other groups in the area, and it's been a very fruitful experience. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about what the IDA does generally. Uh, all project applications to the IDA must follow the same procedure and evaluation criteria as all other projects that have been awarded tax benefits. So we take a look at job creation, local materials purchase, um, whether the project comports with the IDA's mission statement, and if the benefits are necessary in order for the project to be developed. Uh, we have many standards for compliance and transparency um, in accordance with both New York State law and IDA policies. Um, as such, all project applicants are subject to having their application posted on the website. They have to conduct a presentation to the IDA's board of directors. Um, we also require a seeker, and then for any project benefits totaling over $100,000, we have to conduct a public hearing. and then. <clears throat> Excuse me. Keep open a 30-day public comment period. Uh, in addition, we seek consent consent of all <coughs> jurisdictions before approving the project. 
um, all approved benefited projects then must comply with the IDA's oversight uh, for the terms of the project benefit period that's required by both New York State law and IDA policy. Uh, we do that by conducting annual on-site visits and requiring annual audit submissions. Um, this oversight ensures that anyone who's not in compliance with the project terms uh, will have their benefits clawed back and we will recover the tax uh, incentives conferred. So the IDA not only has to collect all of this himself, uh, we report all of our organization's information, including project information, to the state of New York by March 31st of every year. And that process is not particularly fun, having just lived through it. <laughs> so now on to the prime application. They submitted their initial draft application at the end of March. Um, they did, if you recall, state that they will pursue a pilot for this project. So when the board received and reviewed the application at our March 25th meeting, um, it was with the understanding that there are still a lot of steps to go in the process. The board has not in any way approved it yet. Um, so in their application, they proposed a pilot schedule. <coughs> Although they have requested the first three years to be completely abated, they did also propose graduated payments over the next 17 years to generate $3,228,425 in tax revenue. At the end of those 20 years, they will be taxed based upon their full assessed value. And uh, based on how each jurisdiction involves taxes, the city would get about a third of that. Uh, I'm open to questions either now or following the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Ms. McFarland. Any other individuals like to please come address the council? Uh, Chris Garrow, I live right across the street, 28 City Hall Place. Um, probably a little late to the game in this, um, but just had a very straightforward suggestion regarding um, the dirty street block. I'm sure you're all aware of the parking concerns around the lot. Um, I'm not completely against any development that's going on in the lot. I'm mostly concerned with the parking issues, and the plans that are proposed to combat the parking issues are less than ideal. I would like to suggest something that was once part of the Dirty Street Development Plan, a parking garage. The original Durkee Street plans included a garage that was three stories high and would produce 320 plus spaces for parking, more than enough to make up for the, the amount of space that's lost. A garage would still allow for room would still allow room for development of an apartment building, and would open up more possibilities for locations like the uh, Glens Fall National Bank site on March. So I guess in a more straightforward way, I'm just wondering why. Um, a parking garage idea was abandoned, and if it has been abandoned, whether or not you're still considering it moving forward. And that's all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any other individuals like to please come address the council? Seeing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Caitlin Marachka. Um, I just wanted to say that we should, I believe that with the parking garage um, issues, that we should go with the original plan that I want us to grant in the first place. It's um, a parking garage would allow residents and tourists a place to park downtown. And the addition of a park with river access so people can enjoy Plattsburgh's natural resources would be really beneficial to the city, I believe. The current plan to build two multi-use apartment buildings would be, in my opinion, less environmentally and culturally friendly for the city. But most importantly, it would be a loss of a resource that once belonged to the community and now is being sold to a private business. Constructing two multi-use, mostly apartment buildings requires more street parking. And I think street parking is annoying. It causes congestion and is more dangerous for bicyclists. The beauty of a parking garage is that it is built up and not out. The rest of Durkee Street lot can be made into a park so people can have access to the river and would benefit the ecosystem by allowing for greater water infiltration and flood mitigation. 
not having this parking lot means that we need to build more lots across the city, which increases surface water runoff, which leads to more flooding and pollution of the lake and the river. For these reasons and many others, I think we should reconsider the original development plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just for the interest of clarity, uh, would the development on Durkee Street increase the load of demand for street parking? No. No, the RFP and the design that was submitted by Prime required them to contain on the site all the parking that they will need for their own purposes, residential and commercial space in the first one. And I think you had outlined earlier, you may have missed it in the work session, but they outlined uh, all the various locations for replacement parking for all the parking that we've displaced from Durkee Street. I guess I was, I was thinking that if we had a parking lot, those areas could become like natural resources for us, like parks in the city, and it could benefit the environment as well. Mm -hmm. By like having more parking lots, I don't think that's really benefiting the, the city. I think one lot would be <coughs> ideal that's taller. Thank you. Okay. Any other individual like to please come address the council? I just want to say before we leave, I'd be, I'd be happy to stay and talk to you after. Okay. And I'm sure most of us will. Thank you. I will also note that um, the uh, current plan, well, you guys mentioned an earlier plan uh, that was just an artist rendition, I believe you're referring to. Uh, there was no plan um, as, uh, as far as a plan goes, as far as, uh, there was no proposals uh, for that. Uh, project. Uh, it wasn't a project that was abandoned. Um, uh, there also is still uh, the plan, the current plan does have um, an open park walkway uh, for access to the river. Um, it's just not a part of the Durkee Street Development Plan. Uh, Prime Companies is part of the Durkee Street Development Plan, but as part of the um, development agreement with them, we did reserve an easement for access to the river, uh, which will be built up as part of the streetscape plan. Uh, so that will be a public park with public access, uh, and it will open up access to the river right now. There's not, obviously, uh, access to the river. Uh, that's one of the things we like the most about it, uh, the access to the river. And um, as far as the parking garage, uh, again, parking garages are insanely expensive, and um, there was no development um, proposal. Uh, that including a parking garage, probably because parking garages are so expensive. A parking garage, you're looking at each parking space being at least uh, $20,000, and a lot of times they up. For, uh, per space. Per, per space. space, yes. Per space, you're talking millions upon millions of dollars. Um, and right now, I, with the analysis we've done, it just doesn't seem needed. Uh, most uh, experts will say um, that for a, before a parking, lot, a parking garage is viable, uh, you want parking meters in the area of the parking garage collecting about $5 per day. Um, right now we don't have any paid parking meters, so uh, to invest that kind of, uh, no developer I think was interested in uh, expending that kind of um, very large expense uh, for something that uh, wouldn't bring in revenue. If you um, were to charge the amount to park in there, uh, you're looking at over five dollars a day for the parking garage to pretty much break even. Um, so with the amount of parking we already have, and that's at capacity. And that's at capacity, yes. Um, with the amount of parking we already have, um, uh, we have sufficient parking. And in the future, if demand um, comes in, and uh, parking garages are certainly on the horizon for the future. It's a better use of land. And resources, like she said, you don't want a bunch of parking lots uh, spreading your city out, uh, making everything farther away, making everything more asphalty. Uh, but until uh, the economics makes sense uh, and the need arises to build a parking garage, it's, it's just not um, economically feasible. I want to address what your concern was regarding runoff from parking lots. And I, I do believe that there are current provisions uh, in, in, that take care of <coughs> runoff in a more environmentally responsible 
manner, more like the catch basin idea. I don't know to what extent they would be applied, but you know, I think we're all interested in um, preventing runoff, and I'm pretty sure that's in our code now. Okay. Any other individuals or final comments? Seeing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And Councilor Gibbs, second by Councilor Kelly. <laughs> We'll call. Councilor Armstrong? Yes. Councilor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Thank you all for coming tonight. Yes. Engineering study at each phase of the parking. I didn't. Did. I said at whatever stage we we're, we're finalizing our plan, that down. engineering will be done to make sure that it works. Well, I heard you say, like, at each one of those parking projects. I, gave him I don't think I said that. <laughs> I did it too. I heard you say it. So, so what, were you, what is your intention there? All I'm saying is that. Excuse me for just a minute. Uh, All I'm I thought saying in the prime is that.